welcome you on behalf of Health Serve Australia. Uh, and I'd like to encourage uh, and welcome Sally to come forward and I'll stop screen sharing. Thank you. Thank you for letting me share. It's just a very brief overview of uh, some of the theology of creation care and then uh, what we can do about uh, taking action on climate change. So I don't know whether you've heard these type of questions or, or statements from Christians. God is in control, so I don't need to do anything. The earth is going to be burnt up, so what's the point of caring for it? It's more important to save souls and care for the earth. Earthquakes, floods, hurricanes and wars are signs that Jesus is returning soon. Again, no need to care. I believe these are poor interpretations of the Bible and therefore incorrect. So I'm going to just look at some of what the Bible is saying that we, how we should care. So there we read right at the beginning in Genesis that God's creation is very good, but it's it says good seven times and then ends with very good. In Psalm 24, we read about the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. And then we read in Genesis 1, 26, that we are created in the image of God, called to be his representatives, to be stewards and to take care of all that he has made. And here we read from Job that it will be that nature has much to teach us. The birds will tell you things, the plants will tell you things. So much God has given us are there to teach us important lessons and most of all to teach us about the creative God. The British scientist, climate scientist, chair of the IPCC and an evangelical Christian, Sir John Houghton, he said, looking after the earth is a God-given responsibility and not to look after it is a sin. Here we see a triangle with the three aspects, the God, humanity and the rest of creation. But when human beings turn against God, all sides of the oops, all sides of the triangle are broken. Jeremiah is speaking to the Israelites, says, Because of your disobedience, this land dries up or mourns, and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky will die. I think this is happening today because we are not caring for it. We're not being obedient to the call that God has given us. There's no dichotomy between God who creates and the God who redeems. I think this is something Christians often struggle to understand. But then if we read Colossians 1, 15 to 20, a beautiful hymn. We read about the divine purpose in the act of reconciliation and peacemaking was to restore the harmony of the original creation, to bring into renewed oneness and wholeness all things, whether things on earth or things in the heavens. So here we see Jesus is the source of creation. He's the sustainer and he's the reconciler of all things. We read, this is a familiar passage in Romans, talking about creation groaning. It says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, for the creation waits in eager longing. Here, Paul is linking the believer's situation of suffering now and the glory later with the state of the whole creation. He wants them to see their situation in light of the big picture of God's plan of cosmic redemption. And here's another verse that people often, Christians, struggle with to understand from Revelation. It talks about a new heaven and a new earth. The first earth will pass away and, 
and there it will be no longer, no longer any sea. The correct understanding of this word new comes is found in a number of places, including John 21, 1, meaning kainos. Here it means kainos, which means renewal of what already exists rather than something brand new. It's something polished, clean, sin removed, hence looking new, a renewed earth. So we move on to how should we respond to climate change? How should we respond and care for what God has given us? And how we treat the earth reflects how we treat our creator and his cosmos. We need to bank with ethical banks and ensure our superannuation is in ethical companies. I don't know if anyone's read that book on banking bad. Gives you a very good idea of what the big banks are up to. This is our life. Very busy buying, consuming. And yet as Gandhi writes, the earth provides enough to satisfy everybody's needs, but not everybody's greed. So our economic system is all about increasing the GDP, economic growth. Just for your interest, there are alternate economic systems that allow a society to provide enough materials and services for everyone. A particularly good one is the donut economics. Kate, this lady comes from the UK and it's actually been put into practice in Holland and I think it was looked at here in South Australia. And then of course we know about the Gross National Happiness Index in Bhutan. So lots of things we can do. Solar panels, refuse, reduce, reuse, buy locally, grow our own vegetables, stop using plastic bags, go to stores that sell things in bulk, ride bicycles and go to op shops. We can try and retrofit our houses to make them more sustainable. So our electricity costs, etc., can be reduced. We can even consider buying an electric car. And as Christians, we can be looking at community gardens, healthy food sharing together, outside church services, community housing. In Melbourne, there's the Nightingale scheme, chicken co-ops. So caring for our neighbour must be holistic, physical, mental, spiritual and psychological needs. I'm part of a, an organization called Arosha, it's a Christian conservation organization, but it also in the UK has the Eco Church Scheme. It's getting many, many, there are actually over four, 5,000 churches across the denominations now involved in this scheme. Getting their churches to look at their worship, their teaching, building structures, land, and what's going on in their communities. So another very important thing is to read God's word through a theocentric lens rather than the anthropocentric, which just implies that it's all about humans and nothing else. Today, there are many, many excellent, really excellent books um, that can help us understand what the Bible is saying about care for creation. A well-known man, Rich Lu, says, we cannot protect something we do not love. We cannot love what we do not know. And we cannot know what we do not see, touch, and hear. In our gardens, we need to plant bird and bee loving plants, use, if possible, no pesticides or very few. And the middle picture is a bee hotel for the bees. These are desperately need to be looked after in every possible way. 
Here's an excellent book. I'd recommend everyone to buy it. Catherine Hayhoe is a climatologist, an evangelical Christian from Canada, now living in Texas. And she, this book is very well written. And she really is saying we need to speak about climate change to whoever we meet, whether on the bus or wherever. And she gives many, many excellent suggestions as how to do that. So my last one is from the Lausanne Cape Town Commitment from 2010. And it's they've written, the earth is created, sustained and redeemed by Christ. We cannot claim to love God while abusing what belongs to Christ by right of creation, redemption and inheritance. We care for the earth and responsible use and responsibly use its abundant resources not according to the rationale of the secular world, but for the Lord's sake. If Jesus is Lord of all the earth, we cannot separate our relationship to Christ from how we act in relationship to the earth. For, the, for to proclaim the gospel that says Jesus is Lord is to proclaim the gospel that includes the earth, since Christ's lordship is over all creation. Creation care is thus a gospel issue within the Lordship of Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, um, thank you very much for keeping to time. And, and I'd like to invite our second speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Owen, Owen Lewis, to be very welcome. Um, so um, thank you for inviting me to speak, Michael. Um, I, I've in HealthServe, we've been wrestling with this, uh, how can we respond uh, to the climate challenge? And the, the title of the talk is uh, Implementing Climate Change in Our Own Setting. So starting with myself, I've been doing some of the same things that Sally was talking about, uh, recycling, uh, being um, careful about clothes buying, not too hard for me, I'm a bit of a lazy shopper. Um, uh, we have reduced meat in our household, especially beef. We've got a veggie garden. We've got solar. I've always enjoyed riding my bike. And we're aspiring to purchase an EV. Essential air travel is a bit of an issue for me because um, uh, I tend to um, travel for work and I'm a little bit conflicted about the fact that I have to fly everywhere. Uh, when going out back to work in um, remote locations. Uh, so I'm rather aware that um, we've got quite a long way to go in um, reducing emissions. Uh, I'm aware that my local church needs to get... I want to mention um, some influences I've had recently when um, going looking for some import. And I, I found the um, uh, ISCAST uh, New Zealand Climate Initiative or whatever it is, that, that one, a Conversations on Creation Fair. It was very good. Uh, Sally was one of the speakers in there. Uh, I'll show you uh, that was the, these are all available on YouTube as um, uh, YouTubes. So I'm just going to flick through these um, titles of about nine talks in this um, creation care conversations. So I particularly enjoyed the uh, talk by Wesley Fab, an ornithologist, on why we should um, care about um, ecological and matters and he like Sally went through the theological basis of it and gave some excellent examples. I also enjoyed Richard Gisber's talk. Uh, he's a forester and has spent a lifetime of um, uh, trying to um, change the direction of things that are happening in the environment and he urged us to be humble in our approach uh, to the planet and the climate uh, because as humans, there's only so much that we can do and we, we don't know the outcome of our 
activities. Uh, there's Sally's talk. Now, the, the second influence I want to mention is uh, a course on planetary health uh, that has been uh, put up through Wonka, the world family of uh, national colleges and as academies of general practice and family doctors. And this was a course called Planetary Health for Primary Care. Um, it, it was, uh, it's an online course uh, you could spend 100 hours on this. It was recommended. Uh, those are the modules that you can see there. Uh, I didn't spend 100 hours. I got through it in less than that. But I, it, what attracted me to the content was uh, some of the things I hadn't thought about, uh, particularly about uh, the effects of um, heat on health, uh, air pollution and planetary health, uh, about how infectious disease and food is influenced by um, climate warming, uh, about the sense of uh, despair and um, uncertainty that people have and upsetting their mental health and some approaches to dealing with the challenges and our um, role in um, trying to mitigate the effects of climate change through adaption and advocacy. I'd recommend uh, others who want to do something um, a little bit academic to try this course. Uh, there are some of the um, descriptions of that course. I'll just flick through these because we've got limited time. Now, this leads on to how is HealthServe rising to climate challenge? Well, Michael and I both did that course, and we've been talking together for quite a long time uh, about how to um, raise up uh, climate and environmental issues uh, in our programs. Environment has long been there, and we've had some very interesting projects along the way. Uh, but we'd like to um, put a, a stronger emphasis and hope that we can develop some projects that are uh, more focused on creation care. First of all, though, we needed to develop a um, policy, and I'll go through that in a minute. And we also have the opportunities arising out of HealthServe achieving public benevolent institution status. So the opportunities of PBI are uh, we have got a broader developmental mandate and we can also have activities and projects in Australia that are on an equal footing from a donor taxation point of view. And uh, we can imagine and research our niche, uh, particularly looking at uh, areas of ind Indigenous care and creation care we'd like to some, find some sort of intersection of those areas. So we've been working on this policy for six months or so. Uh, having written a policy, mostly written by Doug Shaw, we decided that we needed to write a preamble, which is an argument outlining the theological, scientific and ethical reasons for developing the policy. And the third point is, we need to work out a plan for how to implement the policy. So th these are some of the points of the policy preamble. Uh, you can see that it contains many of the same themes uh, from uh, particularly from Genesis and from the New Testament where um, uh, redemption and uh, uh, the creation are uh, big themes. One of the things uh, I liked about this effort was that we um, can learn a lot from traditional cultures. And then here I'm particularly thinking of, of the way our own Indigenous cultures in, us, in Australia have uh, cared for the planet. Uh, we can learn from them and we can learn, learn to enjoy the creation. I certainly got a sense of that enjoyment from Sally's talk about gardening and um, uh, those pretty pictures that she showed us. So 
we in HealthServe want to partner with other people sharing a similar holistic approach. So we're making a commitment to understand positive and negative impacts, uh, a commitment for environmental sustainability, uh, to advocacy and to promoting choices that enhance human health. We need to define a few things. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we, our purpose is fairly clear. We want to um, acknowledge, recognize, introduce creation care into our programs. Uh, the scope of this is it should affect everything we do in HealthServe uh, so that we're having to rewrite our um, uh, all our um, procedures in the light of creation care uh, necessity. Uh, in our partnerships, uh, we want to have a One Health approach. Uh, this is a, an intersectoral a collaborative approach between um, different uh, aspects, for example, agriculture, uh, zoology, veterinary practice, medical practice, government, international, uh, World Health Organization, et cetera, et cetera. It's trying to look at the big picture of health in the way that all those uh, bodies are involved. We want to work with partners to identify issues and build capacity. We would like our partners to comply with local regulations and do even better than that, and to include climate mitigating approaches wherever possible in every project. Uh, we need to get our own house in order in, in HealthServe. Uh, so we need to be careful about the financial institutions we work with. We need to de develop our policy and procedures. We need to be careful about consumption. We need to limit air travel and make use of Zoom. And we want to encourage our donors and supporters to have a, a, a fuller theological and scientific understanding of creation care issues. So this talk tonight is an example of what we need to do more of. So the next steps for us are to improve our website focus on creation care, uh, to develop the partnerships and look for particular creation care focused projects, just as we have with Dr. Hotland. So I'm very glad that she's following me because uh, that's one of my last points is how pleased we are to work with Dr. Hotland and her project. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Yeah, when people met me from school, they were kind of wondering, are you now not a dentist anymore? <laughs> they, they learn more from publication about my work, work on forest. Yeah, so they didn't get the, what is the connection between dentists and forest? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me such an opportunity to share our project and thank you for HealthServe for um, uh, helping and supporting us in implementing what we call creation care, climate care, or for some people might call it the integrity of God's creation. Yeah, because Indonesia is one of the mega uh, hotspot biodiversity. So many of these will go extinct if we are not carrying them. So one of the component could be how we uh, look after the integration, the, uh, the, the integrity of God's creation. So some of you may uh, heard my presentation before. Uh, this will be some, uh, again, give you some big picture of what we've been doing. So I started this uh, work that integrating the protecting of the forest, caring for the environment from 2007. And until 2016, I, then I uh, decided to come to Sumatra to see how the success from Borneo could be replicated in Sumatra. So in 2019, I started this foundation that also integrating the healthcare and the protection of the forests. Indonesia, one of the uh, country that has high deforestation 
And we know deforestation has many impact, not just climate change, but also biodiversity, health, and so much more on well-being of the people. So we, we are going, uh, and we've been starting this project 2019. And uh, I just want to explain how we do things on the ground. So we come from the philosophy that community know what's the problem and the community know the solution. They are the expert of the forest. So from, from the beginning, before we even started our work, we did our baseline survey. So we interview about 80, 860 households. It's representing uh, almost even a little bit more than 30% of the community. And they said that the threat for the forest that located near the village are illegal logging. And the second is agriculture encroachment. And we also found from the same uh, survey that 38% of the people that we interviewed has no land, uh, land ownership. So they encroached forests for, for living to make, a, to make a living and to earn income and to survive. So this is the reality that uh, we see that is happening. And they also have limited options to survive in terms of uh, their health, their well-being. Uh, they has limited option for livelihood. And also we found that from our survey that only 40% of them are under national health insurance. And 72% worry if something happened to them, how they're gonna pay the healthcare. So to find the solution, uh, how to combat the deforestation because uh, for them is a way of living. Yeah? And we also found out that they want to protect the forest. From our survey, our respondent said that they want to protect the forest. 96% of them saying that but they have limited option to do so. So we, we discuss with the community what we can do to help them, to uh, enable them to become the guardian of the forest. So this is what the community uh, asks from our uh, listening, from our focus group discussion, that they want to have a better price of their harvest. Some of the community, uh, mainly uh, commodity, is rubber and some other like benjoin and there are many different, but in general, their selling price is, the margin is very little and they don't have a good bargaining position in selling their harvest. So they said if they have a good income from their harvest, it reduced their, their uh, tendency to cut the trees to get more cash. And they also say they need healthcare incentive especially dental. And from our survey, we found that 78% experience toothache and only 11% have, been, have seen a dentist. And they also asked for, uh, beside those two things, uh, they also asked for the uh, economy uh, improvement capacity, like they may think of new corps from what they are current doing like uh, maybe a shorter period of harvest of trees that they can uh, start to change from what they already doing. So they ask for uh, another economic that generating some income from farming. So that's how we provide this immediate solution. So we team up, uh, a team to provide a dental care incentive for community that promoting the conservation. And we provide the service that enable them to have access without paying cash. They still can pay cash, but if they have problem, they are encouraged to pay with non-cash that will be uh, used to, nurture, to, uh, to promote the conservation. So here in the pictures is one of our patients that uh, bring the seedlings to pay for uh, her bill. 
And uh, behind them is the nursery that located behind our clinic. And the seedlings then will be nurtured in the nursery before being planted in the forest, which actually we will choose the time that is good for the seedlings to be planted like in the rainy season. So we don't have to, so it will increase the uh, uh, survival of the seedlings in the degraded forest. So all our patients that come to our clinic uh, doc documented in our system that we have a partner that enable us to provide a way to monitoring and evaluate our incentive system. So like this is a screenshot from a previous months ago, but even I, if I am not there, I can monitoring uh, like every day, what, how many patients that came and what kind of uh, treatment that they are having and what kind of payment that they are uh, using to pay for their care. So in this uh, like dashboard, you can see the name of the seedlings that the patient used to pay for uh, their care and where they are locating. And, and uh, this is all integrating with a location uh, intelligence. So uh, with this, uh, uh, how we operate our program with, uh, about 63 Australian dollar, it can uh, support uh, one household for three months to have access for dental care. And also uh, this integration of health, dental care and health and environmental education, livelihood training and agroforestry. Because our program is integrated, it's one, one package. So that could enable us to provide this four service for each uh, household for three months. And this example I took from one village which located in one of the Batang Toru forests. Uh, it's a protected forest. It's meant to be protected, but from the data, it's still uh, deforestation happening in an alarming rate that could decrease the, uh, increase the fragmentation of the forest. And this forest especially is one of the uh, important forests in Indonesia. And with this it will enable us to increase the protection of the forest, which is uh, 2,288 hectares. I don't know if you Australia use hectares of acres. You use acres or it will be about uh, 4,000 acres. Uh, how can I uh, move? Yeah, so we also uh, want to involve uh, public, uh, uh, public global citizens to uh, be with us in this project. So we launching what we call Friendship Tree Adoption, where people can join us in the system and they can adopt the tree that uh, will enable us to uh, generate some income, but also for them to participating in caring for our forest. So this is the example of our uh, pro program that we launched last year and with this uh, with this in the dashboard, we can see who are the people that are donating and adopting trees, what kind of trees that they are adopting, and where are they located. Yeah, this is still uh, needs some uh, improvement. Yeah, it's like um, uh, our consultant said, maybe we shouldn't put the name of the people who adopted. Maybe some of them want to be anon anonymous. So yeah, this is like the kind of the general idea, but yeah, there is still a lot room to improve from this system. But the idea is how we as a global citizen together, participating together as a global community to looking after uh, the forest to re rehabilitate the degraded forest from a different role. 
from us doing on the front line and from people from all over the world, but can still be part of this, uh, the team. So this is a, of the example of the little forest that uh, located near one of our clinic in Sumatra. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture taken 2020 that all grass, uh, Makuna grass. And yeah, I was quite amazed to see that only more, only less than one and a half years, it, it then can uh, turn to become young forest. Yeah, so this is, we visit the location in February, 2020, and, and it uh, already become, yeah, uh, very, uh, very green, yeah, not just grass anymore. So this is uh, an example of how all of this come from the patient paying from, from, the, from the treatment. And yeah, like one of the patient can, can pay with 110 to 100. So we, we did this planting uh, once a year and we also try to yeah, reach out to other organizations to work together with us. So this uh, site we plan together with uh, interfaith community uh, that uh, lead by Lutheran Church in Sumatra. Yeah, so this is, jump, uh, this is one of the pictures after we do replanting. So you can see there's a monk, Muslim and Christian together. We have the common, uh, yeah, the common goal to look after our nature. Thank you.